It was sunset and I was driving back to Kansas from California when I first saw Salt Air. It's an amusement park located at the end of a half mile causeway out into the Great Salt Lake. The lake had receded and the pavilion with its Moorish towers stood silhouetted against the red sky. I felt I had been transported into a different time and dimension. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I stopped the car and walked out to the pavilion. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. The stark white of the salt beach and the strange dark quiet of the deserted buildings made it the spookiest location I had ever seen. I had been a director of industrial and educational films for 11 years. And when I got back to Lawrence, Kansas, I discussed salt air with my friend, co-worker and writer, John Clifford. We agreed that with the salt air location and others we had locally, we just might be able to develop a script for a feature film. John wrote the script for Carnival of Souls in three weeks during off hours. I took the script to a businessman friend on a Friday evening, and by Monday morning, he had raised $17,000. With deferred salaries totaling $13,000 for the writer, cinematographer, and director, we decided we could make the film on a total budget of $30,000. Bob Altman, also an industrial filmmaker at that time, had just completed a feature film, The Delinquents, in Kansas City. And we figured, if they can do it, we can do it. I took three weeks of vacation from my regular directing job, and our crew filmed Carnival of Souls in that time period for $16,400, leaving us $600 for a trip to New York to attempt to set up a distribution deal. Our production crew consisted of six. Director, assistant director, cinematographer, sound man, and two students from Kansas University. We used black and white film and we were naive enough to hope for the look of a Bergman film and the feel of a Cocteau. We wanted a special look in Mary Henry, the lead character in Carnival of Souls. Sidney Berger, who was to play the part of John Linden in the film, was a graduate student in theater at Kansas University and was planning a trip to New York. It was agreed that he would cast the lead for us since we didn't have funds for making the trip ourselves. He contacted an agent and ended up selecting Candace Hillegas, who at that time was an acting student along with Marilyn Monroe and Roy Scheider in Lee Strasberg's acting class. When Candace got off the plane in Kansas City, I thought Sidney Berger had done us in. She looked and dressed like a flower child of the 60s, and she was very quiet and projected zilch. All that night, I agonized over how I was to tell her she wasn't right for the part. But the next morning, she was to read for us, and when she came in, her hair and features sparkled. She projected coolness and confusion. She was an actress, and she was Mary Henry. This is the scene where the car goes through the bridge after the uh, drag race with the boys. In arranging to do the bridge scene, I talked to two counties here in Kansas, Douglas and Jefferson County. Douglas County agreed that, yes, they would let me use the bridge if I could get Jefferson's permission. So I went to Jefferson County and said, Douglas had agreed, would they agree? They said yes, and as a result, we got to film. The only contingent being that we had to get the car that went into the river back out, and also we had to pay for repairs to the bridge. We were very fortunate. The first time we filmed the scene of going through the bridge, everything worked fine. The car went into the river. Uh, we retrieved the car, the first attempt that was made to hook it. Uh, in a matter of a half hour after the scene, the car was back out of the river. An interesting point there, when they hauled the car off with the wrecker, the sound man went over and took two of the mannequins that were in the car and put their heads out the back of the trunk. And I've often wondered what motorists thought of the car driving down the highway with two heads sticking out of the tail. When we left, they were repairing the bridge. And I could see signs they were six by 12 timbers, that sort of thing, to be replaced. And I could see that there might be a considerable bill. When I did receive the bill from the county, it was for $12.50. However, I did go back a few days later to look, and at that time I noticed that I had not seen before a six-inch gas line that ran parallel all the way along the bridge. If the car, when it went over, had hooked 
or come back six inches or so under the bridge, it would have hooked that gas line and we would really have had trouble. Are you all right? How'd you get out? Yeah, put this on. We better get you back to town. What about the other girls? I don't remember. In her classes, Candace had studied to be a method actress, which entails detailing a relationship with others and acting accordingly. However, in the part of Mary Henry, she's really not supposed to relate to people. And so this was a real problem right from the start. However, she was very easy to communicate with. She was excellent to work with and projected exactly what John and I wanted in the part of Mary Henry. Independent filmmakers in the 1960s required total dedication to the project by cast and crew. There were no dressing room facilities, catered food, makeup people, stand-ins, special effects and stunt crews. We made do with what we had and we had to accept what we got. No retakes. We filmed basically at a ratio of three to one on Carnival of Souls. The scenes of the organ factory were filmed at the Reuter Organ Company. They put up their large demonstration organs to see how they work, and uh, at that time they had a large organ set up, so we filmed it. And I think it adds a great deal to the gothic look of the film. Writer John Clifford. Her Carvey described to me a strange outdoor ballroom he had seen rotting on the shores of the Great Salt Lake. Said he'd like to make a film there. He suggested featuring creatures rising from the Salt Lake and doing a dance of death in this pavilion. That was the image he had, and he asked if I would create a script encompassing that. We decided the film would feature someone being chased, and uh, since there wouldn't be much budget, we couldn't indulge ourselves in a lot of expensive effect. While thinking about a character and a story, I was also trying to think of locations that would put atmosphere on the screen at little expense. And one of the places we thought about was the Reuter Organ Company here in Lawrence, Kansas. Reuter builds church pipe organs, and I had seen the room where they assemble and test these giant organs. So I wrote a scene using that organ testing room. And that gave me the idea of making Mary Henry an organist which led to the idea of her going to Salt Lake to work in a church, uh, which caused her to drive past the old Salt Air Pavilion and so forth. Once I established the lead character and the mood, the story flowed easily. I had one of those writer's experiences where a film story just sort of unreeled in the mind. Night after night, you know, it was there on the metal screen like, like an old serial. I didn't so much invent the story and write it as I did write the story and then see what I had invented. After the first draft, I discussed the script with Herc and we talked it over and he made suggestions. And then I went on to the final draft. By then, he practically had the film cast and there wasn't much time to uh, do much more writing than that. I've heard reviewers currently say the film's ending was inevitable or obvious. I don't think it was obvious back in 1961. I think they assume that was our initial intent, that we created a story to go full circle from the car going in the water at the beginning to the discovery of bodies in the car at the end. Truth is, I created the story in sequence from beginning to end. When I had Mary Henry emerge from the river in the beginning, I had no idea how we were going to explain it. I just created this sort of uh, unnatural event to get the mood we wanted and trusted I'd be able to explain it later. I think I wrote somewhere between a third and half the script before it came to me what the ending would be. So the ending may not surprise reviewers today, but it certainly surprised the author at the time. I didn't outline the story ahead of time, so 
a number of ideas that sprang to mind surprised me. Some of the things Hurt improvised while directing the film were also surprises. So I know for the original audience, there were plenty of unexpected things. People have asked, why is Carnival Soul still around playing theaters 30 years after it was made, uh, when hundreds or even thousands of other low-budget black and white films have been long forgotten? Maybe I don't know, but I think it has something to do with the fact that we didn't try to copy anyone else's past successes or anything of the kind. We both felt confident in our creativeness and uh, free to engage the audience in our own ways. Especially considering the low budget, there are some remarkable things in Carnival of Souls as far as the direction and cinematography and so forth. I don't know all the director's secrets, but I do know I have a writer's secret in Carnival, one that helps make the film hard to forget after you leave the theater. It's hard to talk about thoughts and decisions made long ago. I told her people want to know what we were thinking about 30 years ago, and they're talking to two guys who can hardly remember what they did last week. <laughs> You know, back when you approached me to write uh, the script, you were already a film director, but I had never written a screenplay. I had been a writer, and you know, I had just published a novel and done other things, but uh, Carnival Souls was actually the first film script I ever wrote. I didn't really realize that at the time, <laughs> but I had read The Shooting of Story James, your novel, and... Uh, I thought that was one of the most interesting westerns I had ever read at the time, so I knew you knew what drama was all about. Well, thank you. I, uh, I was sure I could do it. I, I had always thought about uh, writing films. In fact, uh, as a teenager, you know, I had gone to Hollywood to get a job in one of the studios writing films and had a literary agent and all that sort of thing. Uh, but I went into the Army instead, so... John, what were we trying to do when we made Carnival of Souls? I think we were trying to do something to make our ordinary jobs more, a little more interesting. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I think we were making films, uh, you were making films, and I, at that time I was an advertising copywriter at the Centron Company. And uh, I think we were doing too many things to please other people. We wanted to do something to please ourselves. Did we? I think we did. I think so, too. Some of the comments that have been uh, made about Carnival of Souls that have added dimension to the concept of Carnival about is Mary Poltergeist or is she, uh, did she really come back and live or was, just a, well, was this all imagination? What actually occurred when she went in the river and came out? Mm -hmm. I, hate, I hate to admit to people that I don't know the answers to these things. <laughs> I think that wonderful thing about it is that people can uh, supply their own interpretations. Well, you know, when I was directing it, I came up against this, you know, just in talking to Mary Henry mm -hmm. about her part. Candace was asking, you know, really, what, is, what am I? Am I? Am I alive or what am I? And at the time, I simply said, in your own mind, you are. Because I think she goes straight forward as though she doesn't know how yes, it happened. Yes, yes, yes. But she, she is alive. She would but have now, to in what that. plane she's alive, who knows? The thing about it is that a writer can explain anything. I mean, if you think about it, you can think up an explanation for it. But I don't think the explanation is always a good addition. Well, the thing I reflect on that is that in our day-to-day -day life, a lot of things happen that we don't understand. That's right. And we haven't got a critic beside us saying, what really happened was this and what you think is this. And... Uh, I think the same thing is very important to keep in a film, mm -hmm. to you've keep heard, the audience a little bit. You've heard me speculate before that uh, young people who are going out into life, I think, have this strong feeling that they, they are going to have no control over it, that they don't know really what's going to happen in the adult world. They may not admit it, but they don't know what they're getting into. And I think that's something about this girl's dilemma appeals to them in that way, because the world for her is just as bad as their worst imaginings. <laughs> she has no control. She doesn't know what's happening to her. Forces are engulfing her. And so I think it taps a very basic fear, especially in young people. 
Okay, I played the part of the man in the film. Mm -hmm. What am I? I don't know. I refuse to answer these things <laughs> as a writer. I mean, you know, what did you think you were? I thought that I was the one who was questioning her ability to come back. I said this is against the laws of nature, or this is uh, against religion. Is that uh, why you peeked in her bedroom window? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Well, that's because the writer said to. But, uh, no, I agree with that. I don't know for sure, except that I do know that I felt, in, the, in playing the part even, that uh, he was a laid-back, malevolent character mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, you never see him Mm -hmm. except maybe in the dance in a couple of looks, uh, actually be aggressive to her. Mm -hmm. Like many of the horror shows today, I have a lot of actual physical horror in it. And in Carnival of Souls, I think one of the main attractions is that it's implied horror throughout. He's, a, he's, an, he's an unexplainable threat, isn't he? he Which is true of a lot of our terror. characters. I mean, right. a lot of the things that we worry about as kids and adults from dreams to real life are things we don't understand. Right. When you have a nightmare and these creatures are chasing you, you, you have no, you can't identify them. Or... And some of those creatures exist in the daytime, too. <laughs> That's right. As they did for her. I don't know whether I could, uh, I could write a film like that now that I'm much older. Well, I think, of course, that the independent filmmaking idea is very important. Because I think, just like you were saying, lots of times people have a terrific desire to express themselves. And yet, with the costs as they are today, and as they were then, comparatively, it's very, very difficult to do this. And so, as a result, a lot of people who want to tell stories that are maybe different from the Hollywood variety never get a chance to do so. Or if they do, they get gobbled up by a distribution company that uh, either doesn't do the decent job or they never receive the funds for it, or whatever happens. That is a shame. And I think it's only when that sort of thing is corrected, and there is an avenue for that kind of production, will those people ever get a chance to produce. I think that's probably true in many fields today, where uh, everything is so expensive. Uh, publication is so expensive. Magazines are so expensive. And uh, films are so terribly expensive. It's very hard to indulge the artist. Uh, no one has room for the person who wants to make a film that's going to appeal to a few dozen mm -hmm. possible people, or a few hundred, or a few thousand. John, we recently had a reunion mm -hmm. of the cast and crew in Carnival of Souls. Mm -hmm. It was real interesting to me to see all those people after 30 years and yes, to see us. <laughs> nobody, none of us, have changed one bit. <laughs> Especially me. <laughs> Candace is now living in Beverly Hills and writing. And uh, Sidney Berger is now the head of the theater department at Houston University. Mm -hmm. Art Ellison is now in his 90s and living in Kansas City. He's the one who played the part of the minister. Right. And Stan Levitt is now li still living in Kansas City, and he and his wife both acting. Uh, many of the crew members are still active in the profession, doing their things, and Reza Badi, the assistant director, is, of course, one of the most prolific directors in Hollywood now in uh, television films, mm -hmm. and has been for some time. Almost everyone showed up except uh, Maurice Prather, the cinematographer. cinematographer. Who I think did an excellent job, by the way. Yes, he did. I think the photography in Carnival of Souls is definitely one of the strongest features of the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The gothic look they talk about comes about a lot because of the lighting style and the camera framing and just general mm -hmm. approach. It to what looks did. especially good on the big screen when you. It does. Yeah, you know, I don't think television always does this, some of that cinematography justice. Right. But also, it's interesting to me that in an independent film, the the way a crew works together because uh, everybody has to do everything. And I can remember in the pavilion deciding we needed a long shot from up high. And Maurice Prather said, you know, I can't climb up there. And Razor grabbed the camera and said, where do you want it from? And was up there in a matter of minutes and shot it. <laughs> you ever get tired of being asked to explain all these things in Carnival of Souls? I mean, you know that you uh, ad-libbed and improvised some things on the spur of the moment. You did them because they just seemed right at the time where the opportunity was there. Uh, sometimes I think we shouldn't explain anything. We should just tell them to see the film. <laughs> That's probably true. 
because sometimes it's like a husband and wife, you know too much. Right. Enchantment tends to disappear. That's right. That's right. This used to be quite a place. It's been deserted for a long time now. Will you take me in? My goodness, no. It isn't safe out there anymore. That's why they put up this barrier. It'd be very easy to step around it. What attraction could there be for you out there? I'm not sure. I'm a reasonable person. I don't know. Maybe I want to satisfy myself that the place is nothing more than it appears to be. Would you take me out there? <laughs> no. The law has placed it off limits. Wouldn't be very seemly for a minister to <laughs> break the law, would it? No. Maybe I can come back some other time. Shall we go along now? Francis Feast, who plays the rooming house owner, had been uh, the lead character in the summer production in New York City of Harvey. She's an excellent actress and I think projects a very good character in the part of the landlady in the film. Art Ellison, the minister, and Stan Levitt, the doctor, are both commercial actors in Kansas City. In the film we have between 150 and 200 extras and those people are picked up at location and in locations wherever we may happen to be. We started our production in Lawrence, Kansas, in the rooming house where we had the scenes between Mary Henry and John Linden. Our first day of shooting started at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and ended the next morning at 8 a.m. During that time, we shot the bathroom scenes, the bedroom scenes, the hall scenes, I remember during the time that we were filming the bathroom scenes, I wondered if I should get a shot of Candace Hillegas in the nude to go along with, at that time, uh, what some distributors might want. I didn't do it because I thought it was unnecessary to the show. Later on, when I did get a distributor, one of the first questions he asked was, do you have any nude scenes of Mary Henry in the bathtub? The scenes that we filmed on that first day actually offer comic relief for the rest of the film. And I think, as far as John is concerned, I think a very important part of the script, because many people have commented after the show has been seen considerably, that those comic relief scenes add a great deal to the horror scenes that come up later, and also gives a relief and a chance for the audience to relax before being hit by those. Sidney Berger, who played John Linden, the rumor across the hall from her, was a graduate student in theater at Kansas University. Sidney had an interesting story to tell me after we filmed those scenes in the, in the rooms in the rooming house. When he was peering through the door while Mary Henry was taking off her clothes, the eye I had him looking through the doorway with is a false eye, and actually he couldn't see anything with it. I didn't find that out until afterwards, but the strange look in the eye really comes across as far as the film is concerned. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I heard you tell Mrs. Thomas you haven't ate anything yet, huh? Well, yeah, I just thought, you know, being neighborly and all this, well, see, I haven't eaten anything either. I just thought we had to ask you out to dinner. Oh, that, that's very thoughtful of you, but I can't accept. I, I know, I know. We haven't met or anything yet, but I just thought I'm sorry, you don't have to excuse me. Look, there's a real nice restaurant, you know, right down the street, and I just thought... Well, I'm just kind of a guy who doesn't like to eat by himself. I've made arrangements to eat in my room tonight. Hey, if uh, you change your mind, you just holler. Well, it's kind of lonesome in here. Good night, Mr. Linden.
Who's the man in the hall? Me? Oh, you must mean Mr. Linden. He has the room across the hall. No, I mean the other one. There is no other. Me and you and Mr. Linden. Us three is all there is in this house. But, but you must have passed him out there. You're needing this food. Going without eating makes you jumpy sometimes. Maybe you heard the boards pop or something. These old houses creak worse than my knees. I didn't hear him, Mrs. Thomas. I saw him. Now, don't talk that way. I don't sleep so good as it is. It's these old houses. They, they're big enough so that you could hide a man in every corner. You just got to not let your imagination run away with you. Are you going out there? Well, of course. There's nobody there. Now you just go and eat that sandwich I made for you. Don't drink the coffee if coffee keeps you awake. It won't. Coffee never keeps me awake. I heard your alarm. I knew you'd be up. Guess what I got? <laughs> I can't imagine. Uh, just what it takes to start the day off right. I make it in my room. You know, it saves me having to go out and get dressed up. I guess I had to get dressed to come over here anyway. Oh, oh it looks just like what I need. Well, and two cups of coffee coming up. Say, hey, uh... I guess you took her on last night about me coming to your door and all, huh? I'm not a very sociable person ordinarily. How can I resist an inducement like this? What? Oh, come on, I don't know all those big words. I'm just an ordinary guy who works in a warehouse, that's all. I make pretty good money, though. Hey, look, I got a couple of shots left over from last night. You want a little bit in yours? Uh, no, thanks. It's not the recommended breakfast for a church organist. Oh, is that what you do? Hey, you mean they, they pay somebody to play the organ in church? Some churches do. Hey, I hope you don't mind about this. I just didn't know you were a church woman. To me, a church is just a place of business. <laughs> well, that's a funny way to look at it. Why? People seem shocked because I took a job in a church, and I, I regard it simply as a job. I'm a professional organist, and I play for pay, that's all. <laughs> Thinking like that, don't that give you nightmares? Strange, you should say that. As a matter of fact, not for that reason, mind you, but I, I had the strangest feeling last night. Yeah, I had kind of a lost night myself. It's funny. 
world is so different in the daylight. But in the dark, your fantasies get so out of hand. But in the daylight, everything falls back into place again. Let's have no more nights. Or let's make them more interesting. Huh? Say, uh, how'd you get to be a church organist? I studied it in college. <laughs> I could have gone to college. Yeah, I used to play pretty good football, but they wanted me to take a lot of classes and things, you know? Well, they're that way. Well, I'm just as smart as the next guy. Yeah, but I just didn't dig what they were teaching in school, you know? And <laughs> the thing I hated most was principal products. Principal products? Yeah, you know, you know, like, uh, the principal products of Brazil are... Uh, oh, gee. Coffee, beans, and snake oil, you know, like that. Yeah. When I was in school, I couldn't care less. Now, what I cared about was girls. Didn't they offer a course in that? If they would have done that, I would have graduated. What's the matter? Can you still taste the coffee? <laughs> Come on, what do you think, I'm an alcoholic? Look, I just like to start the day off in a good mood, that's all. You must be hilarious by noon. Look, I'm just the kind of a guy employers want, you know, the happy worker. Oh, come on, come on. Now, make your morning happy. This morning, you're exactly what I needed. You're gonna need me in the evening, too. You just don't know it yet. I'll rinse off these cups. Oh, no, no, no. Just spoils the flavor for tomorrow. Well, thank you for the coffee. It was unsanitary, but delicious. Well, uh, should have put some of the germ killer inside. Well, I, uh, hate to leave so early. I think you can get through the door. Hey, you know, you got the wrong impression of me. Well, I meant because you had so many things to carry. Oh. Well, like I said, I hate to leave. Well, it's been a pleasure, Mr. Linden, but I'm sure you have to get to work. Oh, don't you? No, I have the whole day free for shopping. Does the hem hang right and back? We might change the hemline a little. The drape is just fine. Otherwise, it looks very nice. I'm sure it isn't very chic to take the second dress, but I like it. We alter it a little here to make it straight all the way around. There, do you want to go back to your dressing room? The scenes we filmed in the department store in Salt Lake City were grab scenes. That is, we walk in, we tell the manager we'd like to shoot a feature film in his store, and when he says, when would you like to do this, we say, now. And he says, now, and we say, yes, now. He thinks, well, it's kooky, but what the hell, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, why not let them? So we do. In fact, we cast him as one of the customers in the store, and his sales lady plays the part of the lady who is showing Candace Hillegas the dress in that scene. Beginning with the department store, John interjected a very interesting thing into the script, and that is Mary Henry's disassociation with reality. Because when she comes out of there and starts roaming the streets of Salt Lake, she cannot make contact with people. She cannot, uh, they cannot see her or hear her. 
And this was a, a very interesting departure from the original script to do this and to do it effectively. In the street scenes in Salt Lake City was one of the times that uh, Candace asked me about the technique of acting for this. She said, what is my motivation, for instance, to cross a street? And basically all I could tell her was, don't get hit. Because what we wanted to do it was during rush hour when she had to go across and actually dodge cars. We had no stunt men. It wasn't set up. She just had to do it. What is it? That man. I didn't mean any harm. I just stopped to get a drink. No. No. It was that man. That man. There was someone else there. That strange man was there. Now, look, look. You've had a fright. Hysteria won't solve anything. Now, control yourself. Look, I'm Dr. Samuel. My office is right across the street there. You've had a shock. If you would like my assistance, I'll be glad to offer it. Thank you. Could I come with you now? Certainly. I'll take her over to my office. We'll see that she's all right. A premiere of Carnival of Souls was shown in Lawrence in the fall in 1961. The audience reaction was mixed. The Bergman look and the Cocteau feel seemed a little far out for the time and place. We hoped to interest art theaters in showing our film. At that time, I took our first print to New York City and showed it to Embassy Distribution Company. But the distributors decided that since it wasn't made in Europe and was not foreign, it really didn't fit into their distribution pattern. We finally ended up with a distributor in California and high hopes for a return on our investment that would enable us to produce more films. At this time, I took a crew to South America to shoot seven geography films. When I returned, I contacted the distributor. They said yes. They owed us money and they would send us a check. When their check arrived, it bounced and I knew we were in trouble. They were out of business. During its run, Carnival of Souls had shown primarily in the South in drive-ins as part of a double bill with The Devil's Messenger, a Lon Chaney Jr. film. Making the film had been very exciting. Distributing the film had been agonizing. We bowed our heads and went back to our regular filmmaking activities. But apparently, Carnival of Souls had affected more people than we thought during its short run. We started getting letters, usually from young people who wanted to know more about its production. Then extensive articles about the film were published in Cinefantastic magazine and David Zinman's book, 50 Grand Movies of the 1960s and 1970s. It was becoming a cult classic. It seemed to be gaining momentum and we were contacted by an Eastern distribution company about a re-release of Carnival of Souls. This year, Carnival has appeared in film festivals in Dallas, Boston, Denver, New York, Olympia, Washington, and Munich, Germany. And now, after all these years, it is getting the showing in art houses that we originally wanted. As a result of its re-release, there have been articles in The New Yorker, it's uh, been talked about on Entertainment Tonight, reviewed by Siskel and Ebert, one up, one down. It's been reviewed throughout the country. And the film critics have added dimension to the film that John and I did not intend. 
However, all of this interest does a great deal to let John and me know that we did something back then that at least had the dimension and the possibility of creating a variety of interest. I'm being clumsy at all this, but I am suggesting that perhaps this figure represents a guilt feeling. Oh, that's ridiculous. Maybe. Frankly, I don't know. Well, I know one thing. My imagination is playing tricks on me. I'm going to put a stop to it. You're a very strong-willed person, aren't you? I survived, if that's what you mean. That old pavilion out by the lake, somehow you associate it with all this, don't you? I could go out there. I could put an end to that, too. I could go out now, there. Now, don't be hasty. If it is all my imagination, I could put a stop to it. Maybe, but at least someone should be with you. Now, I can't possibly get away now. As you say, Doctor, enough. I'm a person of strong will. And the time to go out there is now. And if I have to, I can go alone. After the show was completed, we spent three weeks in editing. And this was after hours again with my regular job. The sound effects that you see on the film and that sometimes tend to be a little out of sync, the sound effects of her walking around, were done on a piece of plywood with a couple of high heel shoes and attempting to do it in sync with the picture. Obviously, it wasn't that close to being in sync, but at that time, we were that close to budget, and I decided, that's that, and away we went. The only thing today people have asked me, would you change that and make it realistic? And I say no, because Throughout all the years the Carnival of Souls has been seen by the audiences it's been seen by, part of its attractiveness is the amateurishness of some of the aspects of the film, and that probably being one of the most amateurish.
Say, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get turned down again. I was thinking asking you out to dinner. I stopped for a bite to eat on the way in. Anyway, I have to practice at the church this evening. Well, look, uh, how's about if I took you up afterward and we'll go someplace and dance or something? I'm sorry. I'm not much for dancing. Uh, hey, uh, you mind if I ask you a question? I won't know until I hear it. <laughs> what, are you afraid of men? No, I'm not afraid of men. Uh, well, you seem sort of cold. This morning when I brought you the coffee, friendly. This morning I needed company. Well, maybe you'll need company tonight. It's better than walking home alone. Yes, it is. I should be finished around nine. Will that be all right? <laughs> That's okay by me. Say, uh, I'll see you in church. Profane, sacrilege, what are you playing in this church? Have you no respect? Do you feel no reverence? And I feel sorry for you and your lack of soul. This organ, the music of this church, these things have meaning and significance to us. I assume they did to you. 
But without this awareness, I'm afraid you cannot be our organist. In conscience, I must ask you to resign. It does not mean that I am abandoning you, nor should you turn your back on the church. There is help here, and I urge you to accept it. I've been waiting an awful long time for you. My car's just over there. I know just the right place to go. Don't you drink either? Not really. Not really. How else is there if you don't drink really? Answer me that. Hmm? Now, me, I not only drink really, I really drink. What's the matter? Do you like the music either? I like it fine. <laughs> you don't like it. You don't like to dance and you don't like to drink. You don't like for a man to hold you close. That's it, isn't it? I didn't say that. You haven't said anything all evening. Why don't I go play that song again? You like it so much. Hey, Johnny, who's the doll? Nobody you know, chicken. Oh, come on now. You've been holding out on me. That's not the kind of pig you usually drag around. You quit licking your chops. She's out of your class. <laughs> you want to bet? Lay off, huh? I got something on the stove there, man. Well, listen, I'll help you put it over. Well, I don't want her to think I even know creeps like you. <laughs> Good luck. Meet someone you know? Yeah. He's a college fella. He, uh, told me about this girl who wanted to meet me. Wanted me to meet her. What'd you tell him? I said, how could I? You're my date, you know. Said you, uh, didn't seem to enjoy my company much. Oh, that's not true. I really appreciate you taking me out this evening. I've had a miserable night if you hadn't. <laughs> Forget it. Come on. Here, join a party. Drink up. Look, I paid good money for that stuff. It ain't poison. I'm sorry if I annoy you. You know, I don't get you. First, you stand me off. Well, that's okay. That's class. Figure you got something, you're just holding back. Now, everything I say is okay. You're a mouse. Yesterday, I didn't care. Tonight, I want to be with you. Me or just with anybody? With you. Why don't you thaw out, hmm? But maybe you want to be alone, huh? I'll leave no, you alone no, if that's know. what you I, want. I, I like being with you. Really, I do. I don't want to be alone tonight. I want to be near you. You mean that? 
Yes. Why don't you and me get out of here, hmm? You know, my room's only a couple of feet from yours. Ain't likely to get very far from me, are you? Stay with you, huh? Look, you don't want to be alone, do you? No. I'm sorry. I'm Look, well, honey. I can't. You ask me in, you dislike me a little, huh? What's the matter with you? What's going on around here? What's the matter with you? That man's after me. You gotta stop him. He's after me again. I'm getting out of here. Now you have to go. <laughs> Not me, sister. That's just what I need. Get mixed up with some girl who's off her rocker. What did you find out, Doctor? Not very much, I'm afraid. I'm sure glad you just happened around. I was going to call somebody, but I was afraid to have to pay the bill. I came on purpose. I've been thinking about her ever since she left my office yesterday. What's she been up to? Oh, only the devil knows that. I heard her moving things all around that room all night. Never heard such goings on. And she wouldn't let me in her room this morning. She's a strange one. Mm. She absolutely refuses my help. I can't say that I blame her. There's something about her that completely baffles me. I've urged her to call upon me if she feels she needs help, and I hope she will. I can't let her stay in this house. You won't have to worry about that. She's determined to leave the city, and she wants to get away as soon as possible. I hope she does leave. I hope she can.
Decided to leave, did you? Where you going? I can't refund none of your week's rent when you go off like that. the transmission. Can you pull it up on the rack? Okay, fine. Will it take long? Well, I have to check it first. Would you like to get out? May I just sit here? Sure. Suit yourself. When is the next eastbound bus? When is the next bus leave? I must get on it. I want to get out of here. I want to get away from here. Eastbound bus, now loading, gate nine.
Where's the way? Wait, wait. Let me in. You've got to let me in. I've got to get on that train. I've got to get away from here. Please. Please. You hear me? You can hear me. Can I hear anything? Will you help me? I need your help. Just a moment, please. I came to you, Doctor, because you're my, my last hope. If, if you don't help me, I'll, I'll have to go back there. He's, he's trying to take me back somewhere. Doctor, you've got to tell me what to do. After filming locations in Lawrence for about a week and a half, we went to Salt Lake. We started out with the salt air scenes. The salt air was definitely not a disappointment. It still, even in the daytime, was one of the spookiest locations I have ever seen. When we decided to do the dance macabre, we looked at the pavilion, and it was that time, and is probably would still be today if it hadn't burned, the largest pavilion between New York and California. We didn't have enough lights to light it all, and we were very concerned about what it would look like. In talking to some people around Salt Air, I found there was an older electrician who used to work there who was still in Salt Lake. I contacted him. He came out and looked and said all of the lines from the main road to Salt Air had been taken down, but there might be some copper wires still in the building itself. So he put a new line in from the road, through the switch and all the lights in the pavilion came back on. 
All the decorations that you see in the Dance Macabre are actually like they were when the dance hall was left unattended. This was one of those lucky things that happens to an independent production company that gives it a dimension that you hadn't hoped to get. The dancers who appear in the Danse Macabre were from the university at Salt Lake. And uh, I have an interesting little sidelight at that particular time. I was making up for that particular night playing the man myself, which, by the way, I did for a matter of ego and economics. However, I was putting on my makeup, and two boys apparently after school, were walking along, and as they did, I turned around and looked at them with my white face and dark clothes. They looked for a second and took off running, and I wonder today, of course, what those two boys thought. The night that we filmed the dance scene, when we turned on all the lights in the pavilion and all of our own lights, it caused an instant reaction all around the lake. People had not seen the lights on in salt air for several years. And now suddenly all the lights were on, they were calling the police department, and in a matter of moments, there were police cars out wondering what was going on in salt air. When we explained it, they said, great, they would tell everybody, and again, it worked out fine. Boy, still over there, and then a footprint leading up to here. And then nothing. Following the shooting in Salt Lake, we return to Lawrence for the final scenes of the show, which takes place in the river. This is the scene where Candace's car is pulled up for the final scene of the show. By the time we got back, it was late September, and the water is very, very cold in the Car River at that time of year. Candace was not too anxious to get into the car in the first place. The other two girls, being aspiring actresses, said sure they'd do it and were in in a matter of minutes. Finally, I had to drag Candace into the car, pull her down into the water, and leave her hoping she'd stay. She did long enough for us to get the scenes, although I think the officer who was watching us film at the time had to leave because he figured he was either going to have to arrest me for maltreatment of an actress or leave, and he, I'm thankful that he left. Cut. <laughs> <laughs>